always good to preach after the altar has been used. We need the Lord every hour, every day. Amen. We find a place tonight in the book of Job, chapter 9. The book of Job, chapter 9, is to preach something the Lord has laid on the heart. And, uh, God help me tonight. I want to dedicate this message to Brother Scott. Get on the heart. They want to battle uh, that you face. But I can say tonight, uh, I'm showing what a true Christian I really is. So many people look for excuses uh, to not be faithful, look for excuses to uh, find other things to do. But I tell you, uh, I've been where Brother Scott is as far as his bad health. And you better run to Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, not run away. And I know that uh, the Lord's got great things in store. Job chapter 9. Look with me in verse 32. Job here speaking of God in heaven. He says, For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Verse 33, he says, Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Verse 34, Job says, Let him take his rod away from me and let not his fear terrify me. We're all aware tonight that the book of Job is about suffering. But tonight I want to show you not only is it about suffering, it's also about Jesus. Yeah. And can I say to you tonight as we look at our scripture, we see Job grieving a pitiful situation. He is covered with balls from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. His children have died. He has lost every possession that he had. He finds himself in a circle of friends. And can I say to you, they wasn't very helpful in his circumstance. Job felt as though he was being punished by God, only he did not understand why. I don't think that's any of us tonight, is it? Man, if God's hand falls upon us, we know why. Or at least we got a good idea why. But the Bible says Job was an upright man and here he was confused as to why God was punishing him. <laughs> he had no assurance that God even heard his prayers. He heard the words of his friends and they discouraged him. He heard his own words as they came out of his mouth, yet he saw no reward. So in our text, he says, neither is there any days betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Can I say tonight, we all have an enemy. That enemy is within our flesh as well as within this world. But I'm glad tonight to proclaim that we also have a Savior. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And he's our days. If God will help me just for a few moments, I want to preach to you on this thought, the daysman. Let's pray together. Dear Father God, Lord, we love you tonight. Lord, you've been so good to us throughout this week. Lord, it's my prayer tonight that, Lord, that you would send encouragement to your people. Certainly this book is about suffering. And, Lord, I know there are those in this church tonight that can relate with Job. As to how hard and how heavy the burdens can be. Lord, whenever our flesh gets weak, uh, sometimes our mind gets weak as well. But dear Lord, I pray tonight that our hope doesn't get weak. That we keep our hope centered in the cause of Christ. Lord, when all is said and done, we'll leave this place tonight better fit to serve you. For you have encouraged your church. I love you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're seated, the daysman, 
This word is only used in Job chapter 9 throughout the entire Bible. But can I say to you, it is a prophetic picture of the soon coming Savior. You see, Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible, if not the oldest book in the Bible. Whenever you look in chronological order, Job is always first. We understand that there was no modernism in Job's day. People lived off the land. They lived in the land. And they didn't have the creature comforts that we enjoy today. There was no hospital down the road from Job's house. There was no ambulance service uh, that could come and pick him up. No, Job had to suffer where Job was. And the only hope and help that he could find was in his friends. And can I say to you tonight, if you rely solely on our friends to help us through hard times, then hard times will stay hard. Amen. Amen. There's only so much encouragement a person can give you. I can pick on my mom tonight. Uh, I need to pick on my mom tonight. Do you know Sunday, as we rode down the Conway, I said to her, Mom, let me... Try to sermon out on you before we get to church. And she said, don't put me to sleep now. I'll wait till then. <laughs> Come on, Brick. Hurricane came. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hurricane tore up the eastern side of North Carolina. Everything flooded. Farms were destroyed. Trees were down. And I went and stayed at my parents' house till after the storm. I get a phone call. But my a tree fell across your mobile home. I thought he was picking with me. He said, no, it fell across your mobile home. We're going to go ahead and call some people to cut it off. So I drive two hours back to Raleigh from Rockingham. And sure enough, big tree has crushed the mobile home that we bought when we moved. So I could go to Bible college. Now I had quit my job. I had followed God's call, and I had went uh, to school in my 30s with two children and a wife. My mom and dad pulled up shortly after I did. First thing out of my mom's mouth, look at her, she's already blushing. <laughs> she said, son, do you have sin in your life? I thought, oh my Lord. <laughs> I've given up everything to come here and go to college, get a Christian education, and that's the encouragement I got. <laughs> but you know what? Left and Lord. You might not say it, but when the tree falls on one house and don't fall on the others, you ask yourself that same question. Yeah. Uh, Come on. See, that kind of sums up the company that Job has. They're looking at Job, who was an upright man, who had everything. I'm certain that they probably envied Job at some time because how good God was to him. Then all of a sudden, in a matter of days, everything is removed, sickness has came in, and Job is discouraged, and Job has no answer to his problem. So what did his friends say? Job, you've got sin in your life somewhere. And here in the midst of this conversation that's going on, Job says this, statement that is so so contrary. He says, is there not a daysman? Basically between us. <clears throat> One that can put his hand on me and on your accusations. And I'm here to tell you today that a daysman is certainly a picture of Christ. Amen. A basin is a mediator. Amen. He is the one who mediates between a good situation and a bad situation. He is the one who mediates between a crime and a conviction. He's the one who mediates between a, that same crime and an acquittal. He is the one who hears both sides of the story and understands them both. And can I say to you tonight, 
that this daysman that Jesus is certainly a representative of is the one who will stand with us in our hardest yeah. day. That's what Job was longing for. He said, where is the daysman that can come during my hardest trial and defend me? 1 Timothy 2 and 5 says this, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus is the daysman that Job so desperately longed for. And in thinking that, I want us to look at just three things really quick tonight. I want you to first of all look at the need Job had. He had a need. He's sitting around with his friends. He is suffering and as they watch him suffer, they begin to accuse. They begin to question as to why God would take an upright man like Job and make him to suffer if it was not because of a specific sin hidden in his life. You see, Job 16 and 21 says, Oh, that one might plead for a man with God. As a man pleaded for his neighbor. Job had looked at his circumstance and said, Why do I not have a friend that would touch heaven for me? That would call out to God for me? That would intercede for me? Why do I not have a friend that is beside me that would treat me as though he would like to be treated? <laughs> Job had some needs. The first need Job had was to be heard. Do you know what? There are so many tonight throughout this word, world that have to suffer in silence. They don't have the Christian brotherhood or sisterhood that we have tonight. They don't have a pastor, so to speak, that they can pick up a cell phone and call and ask for prayer in a moment's notice. No, my friend, there are those who suffer in silence because they have absolutely no one to treat them like they would want to be treated. But tonight, aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful tonight that we have a friend in Jesus? Amen. Aren't you thankful tonight in our hardest times we have one who intercedes on our behalf? We have one we can call out on and he hears us. You see, Job had some needs. He needed to be heard. His sorrow was great and he wanted to tell God about it. Man, I'm going to tell you what. If some of you know what I'm talking about tonight, I do not like to hear people complain about how they feel. It gets me down. It's hard for me to stay positive if you're being discouraging. You know what? It's like the person who complained because his shoes was wore out and he looked and he was complaining to a man with no feet. There's none of us tonight that made it into the house of God that has anything to complain about when it comes to God's provisions. Amen. You see, He gives us Amen. more than we need. He gives us more than we deserve. Amen. He gives us more than we expect. And I'm here to tell you tonight that Job's sorrows, his suffering was real. He was feeling real pain. And he had a God he could call out on. Amen. I think of the song Brother Allen sings and the lady sang it Sunday night about those idols of stone. And people pray to them and they expect an answer, but the answer doesn't come. I'm glad tonight that we have a God we can call out on. Amen. And He hears and understands. Amen. Amen. You see, Job had sorrow and he wanted to be heard. He had grief. His suffering was so intense. He had confusion. He did not understand his oppression. Man, how much worse would Job's condition have been? Had silence. Then all he had. No, my friend, he had a daysman. Someone that would hear his need. Amen. Then he also had a need for somebody to help him. I told you his friends were there and all they could do was accuse. They could not help him 
whatsoever because they were tripping over their own opinions. Amen. I'm here to tell you tonight, what we need is the help of God. And if we can't help each other, we need to get out of each other's way so God can send somebody that can help us. Amen. 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 We spend so much time being dogmatic on what we believe and how we feel and the way we see things. I'm glad to tell you tonight, God sees the beginning from the end. And the end from the beginning, He knows where we are tonight. He knows what we need. Come on, brother. You see, He needed someone to hear Him and somebody to help Him. Oh, and I'm telling you tonight, He needed somebody to hold Him. You ever felt the precious arms of God Amen. in a time of suffering, a time of sorrow, a time where a loved one has passed or someone is sick and you're looking over that little baby in the hospital, whatever your circumstance might be, and you cry out to God for help and God holds you Amen. through the storm. You see only Jesus can take your hand in God's hand at the same time. Only Jesus can hold you up to heaven where there's nothing but perfection and beauty and no pain or suffering or sorrow. I believe sometimes as Jesus holds us, He gives us a glimpse of what's in store. You know what? Hope is a precious thing. If you have hope, your suffering is not as bad. Amen. If you can see the end of your sorrow, if you can see, so to speak, the light at the end of the tunnel, then my friend, the suffering can't get you down so far because you have hope. So Job had a need. A need to be heard, a need to be helped, and a need to be held. Then number two, look with me at the name of the daysman. Philippians 3 and 20 says this, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you know, whenever the writer, uh, the Apostle Paul, began to tell us who we were to look for, he didn't say, yes. He didn't say, pick out the best one that you see. He didn't say, ask the crowd who you should look for. He said, his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Matthew 1, 21, the Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. We had a Savior come at a specific time to a specific place to a specific people, and he came with a specific name. When people heard the name Jesus, he knew that he was there to forgive them from their sins. Then in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, the Bible says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Do you know something tonight? Our daysman has a name, and it's a name that we can call out upon. No longer do we live without the sight that Job uh, longed for. No longer do we suffer without the knowledge that we have an ever-present Lord in our ever-present need. Can I tell you tonight, it doesn't matter why you're going through what you go through. What matters is that you know Jesus is there to help you. You can question. You can point fingers. You can give accusations. I, I tell you what, my son, he's uh, soon to be 25 years old. <coughs> he had a problem with acne whenever he was a teenager. We took him to a dermatologist. I thought we were doing really well. They gave him some medicine. One of the side effects was baldness. So guess what? When his hair started coming out, guess who he blamed? He took a good deed and turned it against me. I thought, man, I could have saved those hundreds of dollars. You could have just had bumps and not had to worry about your hair. But you and I both know that male pattern baldness is it caused by any particular thing? I 
our days with as a name. And his name means some things. His name means that he'll help you. His name means that he'll hold you. <clears throat> Thank God his name means that he'll save you. Amen. 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 He's got the name of a man. The Bible said that his name is Jesus. As a man, he knows our sorrow. For he personally walked this dirty, filthy, sinful world. For 33 and a half years, he walked through the same mess that we walked through. Amen. The same problems that we had. He contended with the devil in our behalf. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave that we have no problem dying. Amen. Because there's a reward on the other side. Amen. Oh, friend, he has a name of a man. He knows our sorrow. And then he has the name of a mediator. <laughs> My wife and I was having a disagreement in public one time. I don't remember what it was over. But we was obviously fussing. And this man come by and he said, can I say something to you too? The first thing that hit my mind was, no, you can go mind your own business, but I want to hear what he had to say. And here's what he said to me. If y'all put Jesus in your marriage, you will have all these problems. Amen. Come on, brother. Well, tell him I was a preacher. Come on now. <laughs> but he was right. He was right. I, I, I'm here to tell you, if you want the argument to stop, call on Jesus. Yeah, if you want the problems to stop, call on Jesus. Like Heather saying the song is just a mention of His name. It'll make all the difference in the world. Amen. He's our mediator. And then my friend, he has the name of mercy. For the Bible says he shall save his people from their sins. Man, a lot of people can offer you a lot of things. These billionaires that want to be president, they can offer you a lot of things. They can promise you a lot of things. But they can't one of them save you from your sins. Amen. And if you think suffering is bad in this world, man, suffering with Jesus is nothing compared to suffering for eternity without him. He shall save his people from their sin. And then last of all, let's look at the nature of this daysman. The nature. What do you mean, preacher? Well, let's look at his qualities, his characteristics, his character. Let's look at what motivates him. Let's look at what moves him. Let's look tonight what makes him a help. In our need. Philippians 2 and 6 says this. Who being in the form of God. Thought it not robbery. To be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. <coughs> and was made in likeness of men. And the Bible says. And being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself. And became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. <coughs> There's some qualities. That a daysman has. Without these qualities, he is not a daysman. He is not a mediator. He is not a true mediator without these qualities. Notice with me, he must be acceptable to both parties seeking reconciliation. That means the accuser and the accused must both agree that this person can mediate their problem. Not one sided. This is a political. This isn't who's got the most guns. This isn't who has the most money, who has the most prestige. No, my friend, it's the one who both parties agree can mediate the problem. <coughs> you say, preacher, that don't mean a lot to me. It does when your accuser is Satan. Because, see, nobody else might see the things we do, but he sees it. 
Nobody else might know the things that we do or say that He does. He rightfully accuses us before God. But He has to agree that Jesus can mediate our problems. And then number two, He must have received delegated authority from both parties. There has to be an understanding. When I do marital counseling, there has to be an understanding God's Word is going to be our authority. It don't matter what He said or she said or what you've done. It doesn't matter any of that. It matters what does say the Word of God. We're giving Christian counsel. Amen. Amen. And whenever God's Word says it, we know God meant it. You know what? Man might change what God said, but they'll never change what God meant. And both parties, the accuser and the accused, must give the authority to this person to mediate on both behalf. And then third, this daysman must be qualified to consider and understand both parties. You know what? It's easy to be one-sided. Yeah. It's easy to do like marital counseling and say, well, I understand the man's part. No, nobody understands the woman's. It'd be easy to say that. But you're not a good counselor if that's who you are. You can't be one-sided. You've got to be able to completely understand both parties. And then fourth, he must be one who has a compelling in interest in the resolution. Amen. He has to have an interest in the outcome. Well, friend, those qualities I just gave to you tonight proves to you that Jesus Christ is the only acceptable and qualified daysman. He's the only one tonight that being the Son of God, He can acknowledge that the righteous demands of a just and living God demands eternal punishment for our sins. He has sit on the throne before He came to this earth. He is at the right hand of the Father tonight. He sees everything from the perfection that God is. And He understands that even one sin in a whole entire lifetime still deserves eternal punishment. And as the Son of God, He sees that. But you know what? As the Son of Man, <laughs> He understands the weakness of our human flesh. Man, when He saw the disciples fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, as He prayed hours before His persecution, hours before His scourging, hours before His crucifixion, as Jesus prayed and His disciples prayed with Him, they slumbered and they slept, and Jesus didn't beat them over the head and lash out at them and throw them away. No, He said, I know the Spirit is willing, but that flesh is weak. And that's the Son of Man He understands. Because He has been tempted in all points like as we are. Yet the Bible says, without sin. You know something tonight? He and He alone is our mediator. He and He alone qualify us to be our daysman. By His blood, He justifies us before God. Amen. That word justified. My dad used to say this. It means simply, just as if I never sinned. Amen. I can't imagine looking at my life and imagining that I have never sinned. Amen. But through the precious shed blood of Jesus, He justifies us before a holy and righteous oh. God as Amen. if we never sinned. Amen. Romans 5.11 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, 
in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more often, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. My friend, there's a lot of people in this world that have lived and done noble things. Notable things. Historic truths. But all of them died and stayed dead. Only Jesus died and now lives. Amen. Amen. That makes Him both our mediator and our advocate. He reconciled us through His mediation. For the Bible says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 John 2 and 1 says, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. You see, Job found himself in a terrible place. Suffering not only physically, but emotionally. His strength was gone. He was drained. He defended himself until nobody else would believe his defense. He questioned it himself. And out of this despair, he cries out, we don't even have a daysman that can put his head on my head and my accuser. And bring us peace. But because of the days, because of that Savior, because of the one who died on Calvary's cross, not for his sin, not in his shame, but for mine. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He now sits at the right hand of the Father, and as our days go. Job saw that his suffering became short in light of salvation. And you know what? I don't know what you're going through tonight. It might be physical. It might be financial. It might be emotional. You know what? You can go a lot of places and not need any help. Man, people will turn things on you so quick. It's not just my mom. <laughs> It can be anybody. You think you're going to get help, and they'll give you discouragement. But I came here to tell you tonight there is one. Amen. Job on for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank God we don't have to look into the future yeah. to find Him. We don't have to look into the past to find Him. No, my friend, tonight we can come to an altar and kneel. And he'll meet us there. And I'm here to tell you tonight, no matter how bad your situation may be, with Jesus, with Jesus, it'll sure be a lot better. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Brother Robert, come for the